Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. So today we're going to talk about some resources and strategies to improve the safety and quality of diagnosis in hospitals. We've got a great uh, slate uh, for uh, on deck, and we'll be um, kicking off in just a second. So just as a reminder for this town hall call, we're asking that you use the Zoom chat function for any technical issues you might have. Like if you notice the slides aren't advancing, uh, but for any questions for LeapFrog or for our presenters, uh, please use the Q&A function. So after the call, we'll publish the slides and a recording on the town hall calls page. That's the same page that you used to, to sign up. So to access that Q&A function, you can actually just cl click the Q&A button. It's labeled at the bottom of your screen and, and type out your question. Um, but after our presenters have both had a chance to, uh, to go through their slides, uh, we'll have an opportunity for a live Q&A session also. So you can uh, raise your hand and um, we'll be able to, to un unmute you so you can ask your question. Uh, but you can, of course, feel free to, to type it out if, if you'd like us to, to read out for you instead. So speaking of our speakers, um, honestly, we have a, a great lineup for you uh, this afternoon. So first up will be uh, Jill Dykstra and, and Nikonen. So she's the uh, Chief Health Quality Officer at Orlando Health, Arnold Palmer Hospital for Children. Uh, Jill's hospital was one of those that participated in our pilot survey last year. And from talking with her, um, we've learned uh, a great deal about how they've approached reducing diagnostic errors. And uh, we're hoping in turn she'll um, have a chance to, to tell you all about it today. Next is Dr. Divi Lupadier. So you know, he leads uh, diagnostic safety efforts at Geisinger and served on our project's advisory group. Um, and then finally, we have Mark Graber. Mark, of course, is the, uh, the founder of the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine and the co-chair of our advisory group. Um, he'll be joining us for the conversation after the presentations. Uh, but before I turn it over to Jill, I just want to quickly recap where we are with LeapFrog's foray into, uh, into diagnosis. So starting in 2021, with funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, we launched Recognizing Excellence in Diagnosis. We convened our advisor group, um, so composed of a variety of different uh, researchers, clinicians, purchasers, patients, and their family caregivers who had experience with and, and expertise in this crucial area of diagnosis. So, so far we've published a report describing about 29 different options. So we call them recommended practices for hospitals that are looking to reduce diagnostic errors. We also measured implementation of these practices by surveying about 95 hospitals across the country. So collecting both survey data from them and doing a variety of follow-on um, in interviews and feedback sessions to get at the, the qualitative aspect of what they were doing. This fall though, we are translating all of that research work into practice. So we are going to add new questions to the 2024 hospital survey to assess implementation of a select few of those recommended practices. So now, as always, when we add new questions to the hospital survey, these will not be scored uh, and your responses will not be publicly reported. Instead, we'll use your survey responses as a fact-finding opportunity. So that's to help us better understand how to set a fair standard in this area. Um, so now, of course, you'll have many opportunities to give us feedback through the help desk and through our public comment process. This is the first of many steps uh, before you move to formally scoring and publicly reporting the section. But I will say that um, right now, and I'll slide on, on this at, at the end of the call too, but um, you can actually view the draft survey questions uh, at, at this moment, we've just, just released them last week, by visiting the proposed changes to the 2024 hospital survey. Um, I, you know, frankly, just personally, I'd really appreciate your comments on these, uh, you know, positive and negative alike, because we really want to make sure that we've had a chance to consider a broad range of perspectives as, as part of this um, initiative. You know, that was true in our advisory group, and it's true today. So if you have a, uh, a public comment, we'd, we'd love to hear, and we'd love a chance to follow up with you and talk about it. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Jill. Thanks, John Luke. Um, so uh, thanks to the LeapFrog group for having uh, the opportunity to come and talk to you today uh, about some of our work that we've done locally. Um, we were really excited to participate in this pilot. Um, it gave us a great idea of the things that we were doing very, very well and some, some opportunities uh, for improvement. Um, my name is Joel Dykstra Nickman. I'm the Chief Quality Officer uh, at Orlando Health Arnold Palmer Hospital for Children. 
Um, this pilot uh, is, it, it really did open our eyes and, and I've got three really great of the uh, recommended practices that I just kind of want to review with you and, and show you what successful implementation looks like. We participated in domain one um, of the survey, which was leadership structures and systems. Domain two is actually the, um, the diagnostic process. Next slide. So I'll give you just a bit of um, uh, feedback just on, on our Orlando Health. Our mission uh, really drives uh, what we do here every day. It's to improve the health and quality of life of the individuals and communities that we serve. Next slide. One way that we live out this mission is through our strategic imperatives here that we've coined uh, the Orlando Health Way. So we care for and about our patients and communities, and we focus on providing the best quality care uh, in the safest possible environment for our patients. We work collaboratively uh, with our physician partners to earn their loyalty while treating our team members with care and respect. We really want Orlando Health to be the best place to work. We drive growth and innovation to ensure that our customers have easy access to the latest treatments and services uh, available. And then we strengthen our economics so that we can continue to, pro to provide those services and serve all the needs of our community. And lastly, we achieve our mission by providing the best possible experience for customers, which are their patients uh, and their loved ones. Next slide. This is just a quick snapshot of our organization as of June 2nd, 2023. Uh, we have 29 hospitals and ERs, uh, 15 hospitals and nine uh, freestanding ERs are currently open with four hospitals and one freestanding ER coming online soon. Um, of course, our, our uh, wonderful adult facilities um, are also uh, joined by uh, our dedicated children's hospital and the busiest hospital in Florida for women and babies, which is Orlando Health Winnie Palmer Hospital. And we have nine specialty uh, institutes that provide just a phenomenal comprehensive care that arranges from heart and vascular to orthopedics and digestive health. And all of these services and facilities are supported by an amazing 27,000 plus team members and more than 4,700 uh, physicians. And so we really have quite the reach. Next slide. These are just some of our high quality awards and outcomes that we have been recognized by several national organizations, including US News and World Report. Next slide. And then just a bit about Arnold Palmer specifically. Uh, so we are a 156 bed freestanding pediatric facility. We're the region's only level one pediatric trauma center. And we were the first American College of Surgeon uh, level one children's surgery center in Orlando. Uh, we have approximately 60,000 uh, ED visits annually with 1300 of those being trauma admissions. And we perform about 6,200 um, operative procedures annually. Um, so we're connected to Winnie Palmer Hospital and their 149 bed level NICU, which we provide services for those babies um, via a bridge. I tell you about us um, and our facilities. We aren't a big academic medical center. And so I wanna make sure you, you realize these initiatives can be implemented successfully by all organizations, big or small. So next slide, we'll go ahead and dive in. So again, we were assigned domain one, which is leadership structures and systems. And for this pilot, it's important to understand what diagnostic excellence means. Uh, LeapFrog uh, defines that as making and communicating uh, a correct and timely diagnosis using appropriate resources while maximizing the patient's uh, experience and managing uncertainty. So it's a really, um, it's a complex process, which I'll show you in the next slide. So it really starts when the patient experiences a health problem and then engages uh, in a healthcare system for care. Um, and the first part of that process is really the initial uh, diagnostic assessment. And that's the patient's history, their physical exam, um, uh, forming a, a differential diagnosis or a list of differentials, and then ordering some tests. And then you enter the diagnostic testing period, which is the really performing the testing, interpreting those results and communicating the test results. And then the patient hopefully reaches um, a final diagnosis. This process is complex. It's very collaborative um, that it really can unfold over days or weeks or um, hopefully not months, but, um, but it's not foolproof <laughs> and it's prone to errors and it's, it's prone to biases that can lead to misdiagnosis and harm. 
So about 5% of outpatients experience a diagnostic error, and uh, diagnostic errors contribute to about 6 to 17% of inpatient medical adverse events and about 10% of deaths that come to autopsy. The Institute of Medicine um, published a white paper titled uh, Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare, and that noted that the diagnostic process, although highly complex, they don't often see these um, delays in, in error or delays in diagnosis or a misdiagnosis in those rare conditions, but surprisingly, it's in those well-known diseases that we see every single day. So this is this system is not foolproof. Uh, this The errors can be system related um, in which you have an incorrect result or it's tagged, a uh, result is tagged to the, to the wrong EMR or it's a cognitive error. So a physician or a provider might have insufficient data and they can't make the right decision or they have made the wrong decision despite having an adequate amount of information. And that's sometimes what we think about as anchoring and that's sticking to that initial impression and that initial diagnosis despite the fact that you have um, information and diagnostic test results that tell you something different. Next slide. So uh, for those who aren't familiar with the survey or um, didn't hear about it on another call, um, this is the five-point uh, implementation scale that we were provided that we, we had to uh, answer those questions for. So the response anchors are we're not, it's not under consideration. We're not going to discuss it. We have no uh, intention of implementing the practice to fully implemented and evaluating the impact. And that is a housewide implementation scale. So in between those two uh, response anchors, um, there are three categories. It's either exploring and preparing where you're having discussions, you're assessing your staff and recruiting additional resources, um, or you're planning and resourcing, which you have a strategy formed and you have all of your resources in place, to then implementing and operationalizing. Um, and that could be some or or all of the elements on one or more of your units. And this is where really your PDSA cycles happen before you fully implement and evaluate the, the impact. Next slide. So the first practice, and I'm not gonna go in order because the last one is actually the most impactful, I think. Um, so this first, uh, the uh, one of the recommended practices, 1.4B, was measuring and monitoring diagnostic safety outcomes. Um, and that's really having processes and structures in place to help identify and track the diagnostic errors that you're that you're having at your facility, um, and then including errors that result in harm or death. Um, you really want to focus on the high risk areas of your hospital, the ED, labor and delivery, if you have them, and critical care units, and that you're communicating that performance and progress at uh, regular intervals with the board of directors. Next slide. So the way that we uh, were able to answer, we have fully operationalized this um, recommended practice um, is through three uh, kind of different buckets, electronic trigger tools, um, a system of reporting, um, and then ensuring that we have data from various sources um, that is used to identify diagnosis related harm. And it's interesting, most hospitals have a really great process to identify and measure treatment related quality and safety but no real infrastructure for measuring diagnostic safety. So this is, it's a, it can be difficult to achieve, but um, it, it's um, definitely doable. Uh, the first step is, again, is looking at your outcomes, make, making sure that you have a way to um, monitor and measure the outcomes. That's specifically the best step forward um, in terms of um, safety um, and, and needing to improve the diagnostic process. So we have um, electronic trigger tools uh, and they're not really, um, we don't have BPAs. We limit the use of the BPAs that we have, um, but we do have, um, uh, locally we have some uh, uh, EMR tools that we can use to assess for radiology overreads. And so if a report um, has, uh, or if a study has um, identified that it needs an overread by a second, um, radiologists were able to look and determine, was it a misread on the first one or was there a missed um, diagnosis on the first one? Um, we also look at the, the number of times radiology is providing addendums to studies that had previously been read um, to, again, to see if we can detect any potential errors in either a delayed or a missed diagnosis. If you don't have trigger tools, um, you have to have a mechanism to still measure and monitor your outcomes. And that is usually in the form of uh, team member reporting. So uh, in this instance, psychological safety is, is of utmost importance because people won't report what they don't feel safe reporting. 
we have um, currently at our facility, we have an electronic uh, risk reporting tool that's available to all team members. Um, and we do know that um, if you have it so where it's easily accessible for all your team members, you don't have to go anywhere else um, to find this tool, um, that they're more likely to use it. And so our risk reporting system is not anonymous, but anybody can file an event about another team member, about a provider, about a delayed or a misdiagnosis, um, or a suspected delayed or misdiagnosis. For those team members that don't feel safe and don't feel like they want to put their name on an incident report, we also have a confidential compliance hotline, and that's managed and operated by an independent communication company that really ensures the obje objectivity of reporting. That uh, compliance hotline is toll free. It's available 24 hours a day. Calls are not recorded, and there's really no effort to try to identify who the, the caller is. And you don't even need to provide your name. So all you have to do is state the problem, what you witnessed, what you saw, what you believe. Um, and then um, those are taken uh, incredibly serious and, and investigated. And lastly, you need to make sure that you have data from a lot of sources, because we found here we have a lot, we're, we're small enough that we have a lot of um, verbal reports. Uh, so my quality team currently consists of about 13 team members. And so we really review different, um, we have different uh, requirements. So since we are a uh, level one trauma center and a level one children's surgery verified center through the American College of Surgeons, there are certain events in which we have to report. So we have processes to review, again, those radiology overreads or those uh, radiology addendums. Um, and we need to make sure that, again, those are things that we also have to report to those either Florida Department of uh, Health Trauma System or the American College of Surgeons. We then have to form PI around those events, too, to make sure that we're reducing um, future occurrences of diagnostic related harm. We also um, utilize REDCap. And this is where our APPs or our advanced providers and uh, attendings can submit cases for review where harm may or may not have reached the patient. Um, again, we have the risk management system that I spoke of earlier that team members can report harm um, or near misses to the quality team. And then we also gather information from our surgical and medical subspecialty m, &M meetings because they do disclose and are very transparent in their meetings where uh, sometimes we might not have been made aware and then lastly, we do monthly mortality reviews, uh, and we always try to find um, opportunities for improvement with those. We also have two novel group meetings here. Um, we call them surgical PIPs and medical PIPs, and the PIPs stands for performance improvement and patient safety. And our surgical PIPs is attended by all of our surgical subspecialists, and obviously medical PIPs is, is our, our medical providers. Our surgical PIPs meeting is very robust. We review probably on average about 30 cases a month there. It's very transparent. We don't hide patient data. We don't hide physician names. And so we're very transparent because we believe that you can't make an improvement um, by sequestering and, and keeping your data secret. And the same for medical PIPs. We usually only do one to two cases a month at medical PIPs, but we really engage our pathologist who will come in and uh, residents will present the case, but then our pathologist can come in and, and present autopsy findings. And then that's really just a robust discussion on if something went wrong, where did we, uh, where did we lag and, and what kind of opportunities for improvement do we have? Those two meetings were so successful that we recently formed a trauma PIPs that is just for um, case review um, and potential um, harm events from our trauma population. And then lastly, we have root cause analysis um, uh, on different cases, and those findings are shared at the facility level. They are shared throughout the hospital, all ancillary and all nursing departments. Um, and we really do it because A, we, we, we need to be transparent with our team so that they know it's okay to be transparent with us. But it really does help to uh, improve that team collaboration and, and confidence by focusing on finding that root cause instead of finding a team member at fault. Um, so those have gone, and, and what we have learned through root cause analysis, it might've occurred on one unit, but when we would present the findings on um, um, different nursing units, um, they realized that they have a workaround in which they could have potentially seen a diagnostic error. And so it really does um, help with housewide improvement. Next slide. So the second standard is practice 1.2C, which is 
target training and education to nurses, pharmacists, and allied health professionals. And I think every probably hospital in the country can easily achieve this one. We achieve this standard through our sepsis education and resources that we have available to our uh, team members. So it's important, obviously, to train the providers, uh, and they're in the position of making a diagnosis, but it's also important to target training around the diagnostic process to nurses, pharmacists, physical therapists, and other allied health professionals um, to make sure that they understand that all health professionals um, are responsible for an accurate and timely diagnosis. It takes a team. And so when we really started to, um, I don't know how many pediatric centers are on the line, but adults, you know, with the sepsis core measure, there's lots of training. And for pediatrics, some of the bundles that, uh, that we utilize um, were from a very small group of hospitals that were part of the Children's Hospital Association Improving Pediatric Sepsis Outcomes Collaborative. And so um, this participation in this national collaborative really helped us to, to look at our process and our diagnostic process around sepsis uh, diagnosis to reduce that pediatric sepsis mortality um, and improve the survivor outcomes. Um, so we really focus on screening and the diagnostic process required to reach a screen, um, and that includes nurses and physicians. The uh, second key process is a sepsis huddle for all of our patient care team members to confirm that A, we're doing the appropriate diagnostic testing and that we're not missing any potential diagnostic testing. And then utilizing an order set that can help provide a standardized evidence-based care pathway, help to reduce some variation and then unintentional oversight, which is um, a misdiagnosis, a misdiagnostic test. And then we look at also time to first bolus and time to antibiotic. Um, we, tar we targeted um, our uh, ICU and floor attendings so that they could really uh, help to, to um, detect those patients who were either developing sepsis or severe sepsis so that we could intervene and perform the appropriate testing early. And then we also start from the day that a new nurse or a respiratory therapist or any professional that enters our building understands the importance of early recognition of sepsis. Um, and so again, that starts from the minute that a new team member is involved. And we have different resources um, that we use to make sure team members know what our current results are and our current mortality is. Um, we can look at uh, different pieces of the diagnostic test associated with a sepsis um, diagnosis to make sure that we're appropriately ordering um, the testing required. But really, it's a an accurate and, and timely diagnosis takes a team. So targeting the training to all of your team members is important. The next slide. So some of the other things that we do around sepsis and education for our team members, we know that everybody can't go to a national collaborative. And so the, the sepsis, the pediatric sepsis national collaborative learning session, we would do watch parties. And so providing lunch in a room where people could just kind of come in and either catch different parts of uh, the um, sessions that were available and have some lunch. Um, it really did help to increase the participation of our teams here. Um, having roaming clinics to review bundle elements and the diagnostic testing process. Um, you know, if our logo, um, it looks kind of like a Gumby with two, two kids kind of holding hands. And so one of those Gumbies went on every single computer in our facility. And it said on there, if you're huddling, then you need to use the order set because the huddle and the order set go hand in hand. And that really increased our huddle compliance and it increased our order set um, uh, utilization. We provide an annual presentation to all our new residents and fellows on uh, pediatric sepsis and the diagnostic process. We do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. So if we have a patient uh, that uh, Epic pings as having an elevated sepsis score, we can kind of go up to the unit and talk to the nurse and just collaborate peer to peer on. If we think it's sepsis, then we probably need to call a huddle and get the providers involved. Um, versus, is this something else that's that's going on? Does the patient, um, you know, does the patient have um, pain and therefore they're tachycardic? We also have a number of tools and pathways that we have posted on our quality SharePoint site, so team members can easily access the bundles and see exactly what. Um, identification, resuscitation, and, es and, and escalation and de-escalation both look like for ped sepsis. Uh, we really push uh, any sepsis or pediatric sepsis focused webinar out to all of our team members. It's a great way for them to get CEUs, and then it's a great way to get 
uh, the constant reinforcement and, and education out. And then lastly, we share monthly compliance and outcomes results to all the units. We can target um, the uh, outcomes and compliance with uh, some of those process measures down to the unit level just to let them know how they're doing. We also roll it up into housewide compliance, but this does really allow for some targeted um, QI support and retraining. Next slide. This is just a, a screenshot of uh, the sepsis uh, dashboard that we created uh, here with the help of our Health Catalyst partners uh, to really talk about um, to display our results on a monthly level so that um, you'll see down in the in the bottom right corner, it's grayed out for you, but we tell you down to the provider level what your um, time to blood culture is, what your time to antibiotic, what your time to fluid bolus is, because again, you can't improve what you don't know. And so these are available um, on our SharePoint site for any one of our team members to go in and look at our compliance. And the next slide. This, this slide is probably, this practice was probably my favorite. It was probably the easiest to achieve, which is practice 1.2D, making it easy for hospital staff to report diagnostic errors and concerns. And this sounds like this would probably be the hardest one to do, but it's actually, I think it allows for a lot of innovation. So do we have a formal process in place for staff to report errors and concerns and that they encourage psychological safety and staff adoption? So they have to include all of those six steps below. So staff training, on how and when to report diagnostic er uh, errors and concerns. And so again, uh, our risk manager and myself um, target our new, we call them our new uh, RN residency graduates. So they we present at each one of those meetings for uh, new team members uh, and new residents and fellows. And we talk about the importance of, if you see something, say something about getting online and reporting those events, whether big or small, um, even something that starts out small, if it's trended over time, uh, becomes an opportunity. Um, a formal protocol for investigating and responding to staff reported diagnostic errors, concerns, and questions. Um, and again, in partnership with risk management, we do have a, a protocol for investigating um, each one of those. So the quality team and risk management really work hand in hand. The quality team will work up um, uh, incident reports and uh, the medical side of kind of what happened and then it's really kind of up to risk management at that point if we want to continue with a um, root cause analysis um, or um, if this is a track and trend. Um, number three, a formal protocol for notifying cl uh, clinicians involved in the patient's care. And we do. Um, if we ever get an incident report um, or uh, uh, an event that needs to care review or a peer review, all the clinicians, including nursing, um, physical therapy, pharmacy, they're involved uh, in that care review process because their input is important. Um, a formal protocol for non-punitively including involved uh, clinicians and in investigations. We invite every single member of the care team to the root cause analysis. Um, I have talked with several nurses over the past few months about the importance of stepping up and saying something and feeling psychologically safe to do so. Um, and then an emphasis on transparency. I firmly believe that if we can't be transparent with what we do wrong, then we really shouldn't be bragging about what we do well. Um, we all have opportunity for improvement um, and there is not, there's nothing, there should be nothing punitive in the process because we will never fix what people are too scared to report. I had a team member come to me uh, a couple months ago um, and she made a medication, medication error and it was very, um, thankfully the patient was, was safe um, but she said, you know, I put an insert report, I had a medication error. And I took her one of our prized little coffee mugs and I filled it with candy and I went up and I talked to her and I said, thank you. Thank you for reporting this because I wouldn't know that there was a workaround that failed you, um, but I wouldn't have known that there was that workaround unless you had told on yourself. And you could have easily not done that, but we never would have known. Um, and she really thought she was going to get fired. And I said, nope. I'm here to, to give you a coffee mug and candy because I'm so proud that you actually took the time to put in the incident report and let us know so that we can fix it on the backside. And then lastly, a formal protocol for soliciting feedback from staff on the psychological safety and usability of the process. So next slide. These are really the strategies uh, to implement uh, this practice successfully. So again, 
you have to have an easy to use system. There needs to be an easy way that staff can access it, whether it's a link or an icon on your hospital desktop, um, something that's easy for them to use so that you get actual, uh, you get uh, timely reporting. Um, there has to be senior administrative uh, involvement in all of the reviews or most of the reviews so that if we can help with retraining either housewide or unit specific where indicated. And then lastly, uh, sorry, last two, um, if you have a great relationship with either a quality person or a senior administration a team member, or even a person, but risk and a champion is success because um, risk um, has a, a can have a negative connotation um, and me people immediately think they're going to be in trouble. So if you can pair your risk manager up with someone who's a champion for transparency and improvement work, um, then uh, it, it really does, it, it's easy. And then um, ongoing training for your medical residents and your fellows, um, because anybody can make a mistake. Um, and so targeting our new um, providers um, really has the ability to um, hopefully decrease those um, adverse events. And we do that through kind of trainee-led monthly conferences where they can review some of the adverse event reports um, and then reporting procedures. And then how do we integrate all of this into their daily, um, daily activities? And that's all I have. So thank you very much for um, letting me tell you a bit about what we do good here and, and how successful we've been. And, and I'm happy at, at the end to answer questions. Thanks so much, Jill. And actually, um, we have just um, two questions in the in the chat, but uh, I think we'll pass it over to, to Divi and give him a, a chance to run through his, his material, and then we'll take those questions at the end. Uh, so with that, uh, Divi, are you ready to share your screen? Thank you, John Luke. John, look, can you see my screen? Yes. That's great. Thank you and um, hello everyone. So we have about, I think, 28-ish minutes left for this meeting. I will try and make uh, the most of it. Um, so my name is Divi Upadhyaya and I work at Geisinger. Um, we've been doing some uh, work on diagnostic safety um, uh, for a while. I've actually been working full-time on diagnostic safety at Geisinger for the last uh, six plus years. And I appreciate this opportunity to highlight, uh, just as an example, um, the work that we do in order to encourage all of you to elevate diagnostic safety at your organizations. And there can be nothing uh, better than this opportunity that's presented in the form of this leapfrog uh, work. Uh, so very quickly about Geisinger, it's an integrated healthcare system. Uh, we have about 1, 1. 1.5 million patients that we serve, predominantly rural, central, located in central northeast in Pennsylvania. Um, and you know, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of history here. This organization is 100 plus years old. There you see this picture here is from uh, our headquarters uh, in Danville, Pennsylvania, lovely Danville. Um, and uh, it's just um, you know a great organization. Uh, there's a long standing history of being uh, excellent at even the leapfrog grades. Um, uh, most recently, this hospital that is in the picture has also on its A. Um, uh, but but this is something interesting here. So a bit of our uh, history in quick pictures. I took this picture. It's one of my favorite pictures because this uh, kind of shows, um, um, you know, Mrs. Abigail Geisinger, uh, the founder of this uh, healthcare organization. So this is the Geisinger couple that uh, basically donated their wealth and led to the creation of this uh, healthcare institution in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but in these three, in this picture are three gentlemen here. Um, uh, this is Dr. Dennis Toretti, uh, Chairman Emeritus of Medicine and the, you know, the founding leader for uh, diagnostic safety here at Geisinger. He started working on this after stepping down as chairman uh, almost uh, nine um, years ago. And that's Dr. Hadeep Singh. Um, uh, some of you may have, uh, you know, heard him at the uh, second uh, town hall. Uh, and that's uh, Dr. Daniel Yang uh, uh, representing the Moore Foundation. So this is really our story. Um, the Geisinger Institution was already, you know, uh, trying to understand what to do about diagnostic errors uh, when an opportunity presented itself by 
creating this very unique collaboration between uh, you know researchers and uh, very innovative operational leaders uh, in trying to develop this diagnostic safety surveillance system. So this started out as a research grant. It's ended now, uh, but the organization is doing everything it can to sustain this momentum uh, that we've created. Um, and not to forget, um, you know, that's the reason I put acknowledgements on top uh, is because uh, sometimes uh, funding and resources uh, make a lot of difference uh, in, in boosting uh, the work that, um, you know, people want to do. The Gordon, uh, Gordon Betty Moore Foundation has been a leader um, and that's, uh, you know, helped us create partnerships. ARC, by the way, is a government agency that does a lot of work on diagnostic safety. Uh, it has funded some of our work, uh, but um, I just highlighted because it's probably one of the only organizations. In case you're not aware, please do look up ARC. And then, of course, this very unique partnership with the Leapfrog Group, um, where I've had the chance to you know, participate with this national um, group on this very important, uh, dare I say, lever uh, to encourage uh, hospitals. I mean, I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. You know, I think all of us know and realize that uh, we are all at, you know, in the healthcare industry, we're all overwhelmed by the number of um, regulatory requirements or just dealing with the business of healthcare. You know, it's after all an industry, um, apart from, of course, the main mission, which is to take care of patients. So in all of this, how do we elevate something like diagnostic safety, which is sometimes perceived as not being required by uh, regulators or peers for that matter? So I think to address that one big deficiency uh, the fact that uh, you know national safety or respected organization like the Leapfrog takes this step, funded by the Moore Foundation, I think this is an incredible opportunity. Um, you know, if I may say so, to elevate diagnostic safety at your uh, institutions. Let's take a quick break. Uh, you know, this maybe this is an afternoon lull here, and I would love to use uh, Slido to engage with all of you. Um, I think this is the. Uh, I'll place the QR code for a second up here. Um, all you need to do is take your cell phones. If you have uh, one near you, go to slido.com. Uh, and I think this can be done in uh, any machine, even laptops or you know iPads. Go to slido.com and join with this code, 1739541. I'll give you all a few seconds to join. So again, slido.com. And you can use this uh, number uh, 1739541. And I was wondering, maybe just let's do a quick check. So, uh, you know, I see there are nearly 250 participants. So what do we do? Are we from the risk management world? Are we patient safety officers? Are we patient advocates? Are we members of our quality team? Are we C-suite folks? Uh, are any CMOs and CEOs out there? Do we have patients, clinicians, nurses? So what I'm going to do is, uh, by now, you should have seen that this poll is activated. And uh, let me see if I can get that screen. Okay. So let's see what uh, the rules are of the people here on this call today. Quality. Uh, this is a word cloud that's forming. So I can see the word quality getting uh, the most, which makes total sense because you must be involved at your healthcare organizations doing uh, work uh, related to the leapfrog group. So we have quality nurse, quality performance improvement, a nurse manager, someone from the prevention team, from, from the infection team, imaging director, ra radiology there, quality and safety, roles overlap, definitely, clinicians. So people wearing multiple hats. Um, so that said, let's then take a moment for the next question, it's going to move quickly uh, given our time. So the question is, what do you think diagnostic errors are? And this should appear on your screen by now. Let me see. Yes. Do you think, um, and this, you choose, choose one option that appears best to you. Do you think these are radiology imaging or machine errors? Do you think there are missed, delayed diagnosis? Are these misdiagnoses? Are these about not communicating a diagnosis to the patient? Or is it about diagnostic laboratory testing or you know sample processing errors? What are we talking about? And I think if you can, you can see the li results live. Uh, this is great. This is great. So we have at least 
um, 82 percent. And this, this is no right answer. You know, I mean, I know I kept this limited to just one option, but I think this brings up the point that I wanted to make and just to level set our expectations. And it's great to know that you know, 250 people attending this meeting and, you know, vast majority of them have kind of a shared mental model on what missed, what diagnostic errors are, because sometimes uh, when you work um, real time and you know you interact with people on the ground, it's very easy to misunderstand diagnostic errors as those related to just diagnostic testing. Um, and you might come across uh, you know colleagues. So always take the um, effort uh, to clear up and um, describe diagnostic errors as missed, delayed, or incorrect diagnosis because that can help um, capture more information and data. So I'll go back. Um, thank you for the participation, really appreciate it. So this child is Rory Staunton. Some of you may know his story, um, but I'll quickly, uh, you know, my idea here was to present a couple of cases to again, uh, level set our understanding and, and I'll come to the point why, why we're doing this. Now, Rory, um, you know, uh, in, in New York um, about a few years ago, uh, nearly, I think, 10 years ago, 12-year-old boy, he cut his arm during a basketball game in the school. And so the next day he wakes up and he has uh, some leg pain, some stomach ache, he has some nausea, vomiting. So his parents take him to the pediatrician. During the physical examination, the pediatrician does notice some mottling, um, and, but otherwise reassures the, patient, the, the parents saying, you know what, there is a GI bug going around and that's what this must be, but let's send him to the ED. They'll rehydrate him and take care of him. So the patient goes to the ED. At the ED, they take care of him. I'm cutting the long story short. Um, they do some workup. They give him some fluids and maybe some painkillers uh, and uh, send him home. What happens after they sent him home is the blood work came back. The blood work showed bandemia, significant bandemia. That was a very important sign of evolving um, uh, sepsis. Uh, unfortunately, this result came after the patient was discharged, and I think nobody informed either the clinician or the parents. So the parents anyway took the child back home. They were thinking he'll improve, but the next morning his condition continued to worsen. He was again taken to the ED, and then he was admitted to the ICU. Uh, he was, you know, and by then he was in um, multi-organ failure and in, in full sepsis, and he unfortunately died. Now his death. Um, was a very significant, uh, you know, missed diagnosis or misdiagnosis that hit the media and uh, even led to the creation of something in New York called the Staunton Laws. Anyway, I think we, I, I gave you glimpses of the history, not the entire clinical picture, but I just for the exercise, I'd love for you to take a moment here to think about what do you think in this very quick short story that I shared, where the opportunities were missed. And let me just activate that poll. And I will bring that screen up. So do you think this was a missed opportunity? And you can choose multiple options here. So do you think this was something to do with the patient provider encounter where they elicit history and they might have done an inadequate physical exam or, uh, you know, make the, um, join the dots and make the actual um, act of the um, diagnosis by considering differential diagnosis and whatnot? Or do you think this was an issue with follow-up and tracking where delayed or missed test, um, the follow-up of abnormal test results? There's one other category that says diagnostic test interpretation. You know, did somebody in lab medicine or radiology um, misdiagnose or misinterpret the findings uh, do you think this was an issue related to referrals? And do you think this was, there were patient attributable factors? So let's see, the majority looks like nearly 83% agree that this was a delayed or missed follow-up of an abnormal lab finding, uh, which is very clear. Um, and then of course, there are some that have also pointed out the clinical um, bedside, uh, if dare I say, um, you know, missed opportunities in making the diagnosis. Um, and that's right. This is exactly right. You know, there are no right or wrong um, answers here. The idea is to think of these different parts of the diagnostic process, uh, like Jill had mentioned, uh, where uh, errors can occur. So very quickly, we'll move on to the next case. This is a 47-year-old woman who came uh, you know, with persistent cough uh, to the ED, and her physician ordered a chest x-ray to rule out pneumonia. 
The physician determined it was normal. Uh, so did the radiology report say this was a normal X-ray, and they diagnosed the patient with upper respiratory infection and sent her home. Uh, within a year, the patient returned uh, to the same hospital uh, because her symptoms and condition at that point had worsened. A CT scan found uh, widespread lung cancer, uh, ultimately led to the patient's death. Uh, not a very unfamiliar situation for many hospitals, I believe. Um, the investigation found that the initial X-ray had a 1.5 centimeter nodule in the upper right lung of the patient, um, you know, which could have been identified and, uh, if so, appropriately followed up. Is this a made-up case? No. So you have an X-ray which had a nodule which was not read, which was missed. This case in Suffolk County. Uh, Massachusetts led to um, a jury and, of course, a malpractice suit and a suit and uh, that led to the um, awarding of $16.7 million um, to the family members um, and after the radiologist missed the evidence of lung cancer. Is this rare? No, actually, if you open, um, you know, much of the medical legal uh, advertisements or malpractice advertisements from malpractice lawyers, uh, they literally give you the uh, recipe. Uh, in case if you're unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, have a delayed uh, diagnosis of lung cancer, they give you the whole recipe of how to fight for a, a case and ask for, uh, you know, a settlement uh, because of the uh, harm done to the patient. Again, not, um, you know, an unfamiliar scenario. So let's take a moment here again. Remember these categories, the patient provider encounter where there is history, physical exam, the diagnosis. Then there's a diagnostic test interpretation. Then there's follow-up and tracking. There's uh, patient factors, and then there's reference. So I'll quickly activate that question and let's see where we lead with that. I think it's taking a minute. I'll just give it a few more seconds in case it turns up. I don't see that turning up. No, in any case, um, let me just quickly see if there's an issue here. Uh, there isn't, no worries. Let me go back to the presentation. So uh, not surprising, uh, most of you would agree that this was a miss by uh, the radiologist, but also some might say this might be a miss by the bedside clinician who was there in the ED. And I have a couple of more examples, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip them. Some very famous examples. Uh, you know, there was this patient um, who ended up in the ED with dizziness, nausea, abdominal pain. Um, and eventually, this was uh, the first Ebola patient about 10 years ago. Uh, you know, there was definitely this whole story that this was the uh, pandemic or the epidemic at that point. But again, there was a very clear misdiagnosis that led to the health system um, you know, apologizing in full page newspaper advertisements that on that visit to the emergency de department, we did not correctly diagnose the symptoms. Again, all of these examples are to help you think, so why these cases, right? If you apply a diagnostic safety lens and reconsider how we look at the diagnostic process, um, it can help us understand better the nature of some errors or missed opportunities that we often encounter that lead to missed or delayed diagnosis. So these are those five categories that my intention was um, that all of you just, you know, do this um, very basic minimal exercise. You have the patient provider encountered, then you have the world of diagnostic test performance, you have referrals, and then you have follow-up of those results. And then in the center of all of this, you have the patient. This was another, uh, you know, question designed to what, what would you do? Um, and uh, most of us know that I think when such cases take place in health systems, there's, um, of course, there's going to be a great amount of variation. Um, and again, this was supposed to be an engagement question, but I'll just go ahead and say it. most institutions would follow the traditional approach of sending this for peer review or maybe checking boxes for regulatory agencies. And typically, um, peer review tends to be, um, you know, and in some ways, uh, dare I say, and this is just a personal editorial comment, um, 
like a black box. Information flow is just one way for whatever reasons, you know, cultural or medical, legal or whatnot. Um, but there lies value in actually disseminating widely the lessons learned in the interest of improving patient care and so that we don't, um, you know, make this error again. Unless we learn, uh, you know, it's very difficult to um, say that we can improve um, on these uh, missed opportunities that are uh, very, very common, in fact. And that's what the 2015, um, you know, report uh, from the Institute of Medicine pointed out, that there are very few healthcare organizations in the country that have processes in place to identify diagnostic errors and near misses in clinical practice. But, listen to this, collecting this information, two, learning from these experiences, and three, implementing changes are critical for achieving progress. And that's where the Geisinger example of the story here is. Uh, and this was, you know, right at the same time this report was being written, this is before it was published. Uh, in 2014, uh, there were clinical leaders at Geisinger that got together to form this work group. They looked at cases. This is the reason I bring up the story is because it's the simplest form of data that's available to you in any healthcare institution. Um, uh, you know, this might be the tip of the iceberg. It might not be 100% of the data, but there is some data that you can very quickly, um, you know, take a look at and analyze. Uh, this diagnostic error work group, eventually with the you know initial story that I mentioned about the collaboration with researchers, got a boost and uh, formed and evolved into a complete committee to improve clinical diagnosis that still is working. This, is, this was a formal program with a charter and a reporting structure. And as you can imagine that, you know, it was super focused on diagnostic safety, so it did create a pathway. The first thing you do is you collect cases from multiple different sources. The biggest and most easiest source you have is your risk management data or patient safety incidents. You can go ahead and directly engage with your providers because none other than frontline clinicians would appreciate um, learning from, uh, you know, uh, data or learning from the health system about the outcomes of the um, the patients that they see, their own diagnostic performance. There is no clinician that will intentionally ever try and miss um, or you know make a mistake in, in the very core activity that they've been trained for several years, that is in making a diagnosis. Look for patient concerns. Patient grievance is a very rich source of data where they are concerned about their diagnosis. And then you can have triggers or you know algorithms that are based out of your um, EHR data warehouse. Uh, very simple and very well-known things like readmissions, care escalations, mortality, look for diagnostic errors in these. So in our process, this is what we do. We collect cases from different sources. We put it through the CICD review. The CICD is the Committee to Improve Clinical Diagnosis. It's a multidisciplinary group. Once we analyze the case, then we kind of give the autonomy and the uh, freedom to further do a deep review to department and quality directors. We provide a feedback toolkit we, with the hope that they can provide positive, constructive, supportive feedback to the clinical teams and not lose the opportunity to disseminate uh, widely the learning. And this could be in form of your m and or clinic conference or whatnot, and then analyze the situation, analyze the case. If there is an action plan that is needed, then develop it and then monitor it and uh, if there are system issues, the CICD has um, is very uh, you know works very closely with the uh, C-suite level leaders so that they can facilitate conversations at a system level on patient safety. One of the unique things that we tried um, was to directly engage with our providers, our clinicians, our residents, and we gave them methods by which they could directly reach out to us with a you know a case. Maybe this could be a near miss. This could be a diagnostic error or a delay. And you will not believe the amount of information that frontline clinicians can, can give you. What can this system help? So at our center, we collected all these cases and over the several years that we've been doing this, you create a repository, you create a database. What can that database tell you? I'll go back to those five dimensions just to simplify it. We look at the volume of cases in those five dimensions. And this is just, of course, an example. This is not Geisinger data. But this is what putting a diagnostic safety lens on cases that you collect from different sources uh, can help you understand. So if you take a look at it, one way to read this data is that nearly 60% or more cases could be connected to 
diagnostic errors that might be connected to cognitive issues or knowledge gaps, because here are bedside clinical mistakes and here are missed opportunities in radiology and pathology. At the same time, you might find some issues with follow-up and tracking. For example, abnormal test results that are not followed up. It is not surprising when you look at such results, you find that one of the big conditions that is often missed is cancer. So this helps you give, you know, develop patterns and trends. And then maybe you can have programs that are focused on certain cancers. And then, of course, there's a lot of taxonomy out there. You know, we've used the, um, the, the Safer DX group, and then there's Dr. Schiff out there with the deer taxonomy. No dearth of resources. Um, a lot of our work, and you know, you, you can read about the CICD in detail, uh, the initial stages of the CICD, the formation, the charter that was uh, developed uh, in this paper that we've published, Developing Healthcare Organizations that Pursue LEAD, that is Learning and Exploration of Diagnostic Excellence, came up about four years ago. And we just proposed the same common concept from the learning health system, which is you gather data of safety events and good catches, you analyze them, you take actions to change practice, and you create or you sustain those initiatives. And this lens you can put towards diagnostic safety. A lot of our work, in fact, was validated when ARC, a government organization, developed the Measured DX resource. This is a lovely resource. Um, literally, I can tell you, we've lived every page of this resource. Um, and you know, this came up about uh, 2020 or 2021. There's, there's no dearth of you know, examples or um, efforts that you can branch out into from providing feedback on diagnostic performance to clinicians, to engaging with outside organizations in developing AI programs that can be involved in earlier diagnosis in population health. The example, the reason I put this example out there is to distinguish between diagnostic errors and this whole concept of diagnostic excellence and improving diagnosis. In any case, my uh, my concluding point here is, um, you know, this was a small story to share with you uh, what one organization can do if they make their mind. Um, and so if you look back, you understand uh, what is it exactly that is preventing us? There's no shortage of ideas. I think what we lack sometimes is a shared mental model within all the different levels of staffing or uh, stakeholders within the healthcare organization of what truly diagnostic safety is. And then if you put a true patient safety lens, you will realize that just by checking boxes or just by looking for you know, whether the standard of care was met is not sufficient. In fact, it is a missed opportunity in serving our patients because unless we learn and consistently and consistent, you know, regularly learn uh, based from a learning health system model, we are missing opportunities. And of course, the key point here is, do we have dedicated resources and staff and time and infrastructure from IT and whatnot to address diagnostic safety? If you talk to people, they will say, this is the right thing to do. You cannot not do it. But the challenge I think is you make it an organizational priority. The question for all of you is how? I think I close this by saying that this effort from the LeapFrog group you know, could be one very, very um, interesting lever that you can use. Uh, but my personal bias is do not use it just to answer the survey. Use this as a nudge for ideas. So what are ideas? This is out there. I think John Luke mentioned this. Um, this is the addition to the, um, you know, the hospital survey. It's available online. Um, you must have all seen it. Look at the examples. CEO's commitment to diagnostic excellence. This is going into accountability. Patient engagement, directly engaging with your PFAC. Look at this, convening a multidisciplinary team focused on diagnostic excellence. I very quickly gave you the example of the multidisciplinary team that we have at Geisinger, but there's so much more that can be done. Closing the loop for cancer diagnosis. So you see there are so many common themes here that are all doable, provided you, know, you, you um, create the... Uh, not the business need for it, but I think the ethical need for it in terms of patient safety. So thank you so much and I um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to um, share our uh, quick example. And uh, it was great to work with Lee Frog on this. Outstanding. Thanks, Didi. I'll just quickly put up uh, one last slide there with the... Um...
So, oh, sorry. <clears throat> so before we close out for the day, sorry for the flashing screen there, but just want to get to the end. Uh, right. So, uh, well, actually, Divi uh, just alluded to this, but uh, I want to emphasize it myself. Um, the uh, Divi showed the, some examples of some of the the questions that were proposing to ask on the 2024 hospital survey, um, but proposed is not finalized. Uh, we still have a, uh, a long process of looking at, at your comments. Um, any one of you particip participating on this webinar can submit a public comment. Uh, we'll take it under consideration, we'll respond. Uh, and we really look forward to, to what you have to say about our new section here. You know, we're trying something new. This is a new area for, for LeapFrog and, and um, you know, to the extent that you you have the time and the inclination, we'd really like to hear about uh, what you think about the the questions themselves. Um, you know, areas that we, that we might be missing, areas that we've gotten right, especially. I'd um, I'd love to hear that too. Um, as Divi said, so our 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 practices will focus on on a few different areas. There were twenty nine recommended practices, but just a few that we're focusing on um, in this this early iteration of the proposed survey questions. So we're focusing on that CEO commitment engaging patients, uh, processes for risk assessment and mitigation, convening that multidisciplinary team, and staff training and education. So over the last um, hour here, you've heard quite a bit from uh, from uh, from Jill and from Divi about strategies they've used to, to implement these. Um, and we will have a recording of this webinar and the and the prior two available to you for to um, to listen to it at your leisure to to get a sense of um, of their of their strategies and spend some time thinking about how you might be able to apply those in um, in your own home hospitals. Um, certainly, um, our dialogue doesn't have to stop here. If you have any questions about um, anything you uh, you heard today, you'd like to get in touch with us, um, you know, without submitting a public comment, but just informally on the, on the help desk, uh, please reach out. We would be uh, delighted to to hear from you. Um, that uh, the link you see there on on the slide is um, so you can get in touch with us. Um, there were a couple questions in the Q and A, but actually, uh, Jill uh, very uh, uh, very gracefully uh, went ahead and answered those uh, in, in in written form there uh, for you to, to to take a look at. And otherwise, just in terms of the um, the questions that are there. Um, just just to confirm, yes, we we will have this recording available on our town hall calls page, and we'll make it available to you all. All right. So, um, sorry for keeping you a couple minutes. Oh, after sorry, John. Look, can you? Um, there's one more question about one of the Geisinger slides. Can you just oh. see it in the Q and A? Maybe do we can go back to that slide quickly. Yes. Um, Oh, Thanks. Sorry. I've posted the link, and um, you know, a lo lot of our stuff is online also. But I've posted the link on both the uh, Q and A and uh, chat. Appreciate the question. All right. Thanks. Um, well, that's all for today. Thanks to everyone for staying with us a couple minutes past the hour. And um, as always, reach out to the help desk if you have uh, any questions or anything to follow up on. Take care. Thanks, John Luke. Yeah, thanks, John Luke. Thanks, Davey. Hey, thanks, Jill. Take care.